welcome, friends. Welcome along. Thank you for joining us. My name is Leon Pittard and I'm the host of Fair Income Radio, broadcasting from the land down under in Australia. From wherever you are listening, welcome. We are Resistance Media, in resistance to the global management program that is being implemented worldwide. Every day I hear our Australian people saying, we want our country back. People who went to fight for our freedoms and liberties. People who know what the enemy looks like are seeing the same ideas and thoughts being introduced into this great country, Australia. At a time when most Australians feel betrayed by the political class, there is someone who has made a public stand for Australia and its people. Her name is Anne Bressington. She's a member of the Legislative Council in the South Australian Parliament. She was elected as an independent member in 2006. She has been described as a social justice politician. She is committed to working with individuals in the community that have been exposed to the injustices of the systems that are supposed to work to support them. Often, this involves tackling important issues that major political parties are reluctant to address. She has an active interest and participation in family issues, drugs, communities and sentencing of child sex offenders. She is currently touring with Lord Christopher Monckton. And it was at these meetings that she publicly exposed the covert operation of Agenda 21 and those who are largely been responsible for framing it for the United Nations, one of those entities being the Club of Rome. Anne Bresington, welcome to Fair Income Radio. Thank you, Leon, and hello to your listeners. Well, Anne, in an era of spineless and gutless politicians, I want to say thank you for having the guts to talk about the agenda that so many ordinary Australians know exists but are prevented from speaking about it through most outlets. So I want to say thank you for having the guts to speak about it right from the start. Well, thank you, Leon. And let me just say that I don't see this as a big deal, that honesty and the well-being of our country and the people in our country should be every member of Parliament's first priority. Absolutely. And that is the ironic time in which we live in, where your speech, which has become a YouTube documentary, has resonated with the common man and woman who know that they are being sold out by a political class that are either in compliance or ignorant to the agenda of the United Nations and its associated entities. And your speech, and you stating you're, you're elected to do this job, and because you are doing the, your job, this is so unusual today that this YouTube documentary has gone wild. Well, as you said, Leon, what I said in that speech resonates with so many people. I talk to people as well who say something's going on, but I just can't put my finger on it. Something's not right, but I don't know what it is. And as I said in my speech, I sort of uncovered this in 2008 and thought, no, this can't be right. No government of this great country would do this. And then the legislation that we were passing was nothing more than implementing UN agendas into legislation and removing the sovereignty of the South Australian Parliament. And the move is, you know, to do away eventually with um, state parliaments and have uh, local government or councils take their place so that then we only have two layers of government which puts us directly under the federal government and they are beholden to the UN. Make no mistake. You know, everything that they are doing is at the UN's um, request or should I say order. And the, the sovereignty of this country is a great risk right now as we speak and people really do need to wake up and do their research on this and put their foot down and as I said in my speech too Leon you know people say oh you vote Labor you vote Liberal what's the difference they're all the same now and they are and if you have an upper house in your state there is where the power lies and if you have independence in that upper house, 
that are on the same wavelength as the community, all this stuff could and would be blocked. Now, that's good, and let, we will get into those solutions, and that's a, that's a good point, which we, we must deal with as we go along. But what I want to ask you is, what has been the response of the people since you publicly spoke out on this subject? Oh, I've been flooded, Leon, absolutely flooded. My Facebook page has gone insane. Um, <laughs> I've had a 1,000 new friends to my page in a week. Um, my email has gone berserk. Um, I'm getting phone calls. My office is like a call centre. Um, my two staff are run off their feet just answering calls from people saying thank you very much for exposing this, for speaking out. Uh, we've known about it for years, but nobody, you know, at least now we're validated uh, in what our fears have been. Uh, it's just been quite an quite amazing I didn't expect this I didn't even know that that speech was being uploaded onto YouTube so this all just sort of happened and I was caught off guard a bit but the response has been overwhelming well I want to tell you the amount of emails that I have received uh, since I put your audio on my site and this is listeners Australian listeners from around the world that have contacted me and said uh, in support of your uh, of 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 your uh, speech and your statements and your stand, and uh, I mean, what is obvious to the people that are aware and that are looking outside the corporate media for answers, you know, to life and reality, is that both major parties parties are complicit in globalism at the cost of Australians and Australia. And I'd just like to read you this statement from the Age, going back in 1998, and and this will resonate and tie into our conversation. But it said and get the date 1998 for almost two decades during the age of globalisation the two major parties in Australia have conducted a democratic experiment in elite bipartisanship largely excluding from policies and consideration the signs of deep popular resistance to globalism yes. and so in 1998 a mainstream paper said that both sides of politics were ignoring the resistance of the public in their push for globalism. Now, this ties back into the beginning of your speech, which you sort of worked around the dates, 1975. There's the two-decade time period. So let's talk about this, this, this time period, what's taken place. Uh, you know, and we don't need to go further. Let's start around 1975. Look, what has happened since 1975 that has really changed uh, the face of Australia today, where Australians know they have lost their grip on the future of their country? Well, you know, I think uh, it began, from my research, from what I know, it began with the signing of the Lima Declaration, uh, where... Uh, it was said that we were going to bring in a new order, uh, economic order, uh, to the country where we would redeploy um, tools, jobs and manufacturing to developing nations. We only have to look now and see where our agriculture and manufacturing has gone. We have about 10 to 13 percent of our um, base, what was our base economic uh, foundation is just gone. And that declaration was signed by, you know, every major player, every major political player at the time agreed with it. And we've signed hundreds of those um, treaties with the UN since then. Why aren't we told about this? When, you know, who was it, Rudd, was going over to sign the Copenhagen Agreement and our talkback radio host here had him on for an interview, he didn't even know what was in the document. Yep. But he was going to go and sign it. Yeah, exactly. Now, this is a sort of negligence that uh, people have got to say is not good enough anymore. And if we the people, you know, I want this to be a people's movement. I don't want it to be a political movement. Yes. I want people to stand up and rally together and say, if you're not responsibly governing us, then get the hell out. Exactly. 
Well, I, I had a, uh, a gentleman ring me on the phone on, the, on my open line here a little while ago, and he was wanting to um, start a political party or, you know, get involved in politics. And I said to him, I said, well, what's your position on the United Nations? And mm. this, this is a major issue, Anne, that, that needs yes. to be addressed. And this is what's ignored because with both, both sides of politics, they say, well, we have to go along. No, we don't. You, in that 1975 agreement, a new economic order was mentioned some 30 plus times, which, That's right. which was talking about the transfer of not only our manufacturing, but also our, our, our rural, uh, our rural base, our farming base and our economic base. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. Th- this was, this has been because of these treaties, our, uh, the, the, emphasis of the political class to look after our people has been usurped by the globalism mindset and this is where we need people like yourself that say hey this isn't in the best interest of our people we need to make decisions which are in the best interest of Australia first because this is our first family absolutely well you know I had a conversation with Barnaby Joyce I went to a dinner uh, where he was speaking and after um, you know you sort of sit around and have a cup of coffee and a chat and I said to him you know what about this foreign investment stuff that's going on in Australia now because it's not investment it's a takeover yes and he said well he said it's a bit like this and he said um, the Chinese have more guns than us and they have bigger guns than us and if we kick their ass then they'll kick us back ten times harder he said, so, you know, we're in a bit of a bind. Now, for a, a senior politician to admit that we are now being held to ransom by the Chinese, uh, and if we don't want to sell them our land, that they'll, they'll bite back harder, that is a, is a great concern to people. It should be. It was to me when I heard it. I thought, well, here's a man in federal politics who doesn't have a solution to this problem. And to get a consensus of government or the majority of people to agree that we just simply change our rules and our laws to match the rest of the world that that's not even being considered uh, because we're in this so deep so deep that it can bear we can barely dig ourselves out of this hole now well the, the Put thing the fear that, of God into me well the thing that concerns me Anne is uh, members of parliament like you've mentioned that publicly denounce any agenda, publicly announce any thoughts towards a conspiracy. Now, you know, the mindset is almost like uh, a conspiracy can never exist, right? As though mm. that's the way you have to think. And yet yes. what, what, what we are doing is, as you have done, we are reading the actual historical statements of the agendas and saying this is what we have agreed to as a nation. Why can't we talk about it? And it's almost like mm. there's nothing to see there. Don't go there. Yep, absolutely. And I've I've been quite blown away because I've only been in Parliament a short time. I didn't come in as you know coming up through political ranks. So I was just an average citizen thrown into politics. And what I saw when I got in there just I was gobsmacked that this is actually how this really works um, the people and I'll tell you a conversation that I had with a senior member of the, of the Labor Party I wasn't a very popular person when I got in there because of my stand on um, not legalising drugs and all the rest of it and he said to me you know, what do you think you're going to achieve in here in the next eight years? I said well gee whiz, I don't know really you know, I'm quite prepared to take 12 months to find my feet and you know, see the lay of the land and and he said, um, you know, it's a cold, windy, rainy night outside. And he said, look at all these plebs here. That's you guys, boaters, you know. Um, what do you think their main concern is right now? And I said, oh, well, gee, you know, roof over the head, education of the kids, food on the table, um, that sort of thing. And he said, well, no. He said, their main concern right now is whether they're going to get the six o'clock train home tonight and have time to have a beer before they sit down and watch television. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I said, well, gee, as a newly elevated pleb, I find that very hard to believe. 
because uh, they was certainly that certainly wasn't my priority. And he said, um, soon enough, Anne, you'll find out that they don't know and they don't care what we're doing here. And I said, well, shouldn't we be out there informing them? Yes. We work for them. Yes. And he said, God, no, why would we want to do that? Yes. And Is I it? said, well, you know what? You've just given me my platform for the next eight years, mate. Good wake them up. I've got to beat them around the head, beat them around the ears. I'll wake them up to what we're doing in here. Good on you. And you but that's the attitude. <laughs> Well, you, you know what you know what the world's lacking, and and you know what the country's lacking. It's people that have got guts to tell the truth, and this is what the truth never hurts anyone because we've got to deal with the truth. Now, as we're speaking here, it is obvious, and and would you agree with me that there has been a deliberate attempt to conceal the real intent of UN treaties and agreements? Oh, absolutely, there has. And when I've mentioned this in, in Parliament, when we were debating the National Resource Management Bill, I said, this bill reeks of Agenda 21. And, you know, people, if people in here don't know what Agenda 21 is, do your homework. If you do, and you're supporting this, then shame on you. Shame on you for even considering putting these sorts of regulations and restrictions on our farmers. And not only our farmers, but on our city dwellers as well because that legislation covers everybody we all pay a natural resource levy yes and you know they'll, they'll tackle the farmers first they'll get them beat them into submission and force them off the land and next it's us and all we've got to see is what's happening to our rural communities to know that it won't be very long before we city dwellers will not have the right to own and manage our own property either and that's why governments do not want to openly, publicly debate this stuff honestly. Because if people knew that their basic rights, basic democratic rights were being stripped away bit by bit with every piece of legislation that we pass, we would have an uprising. We would have a Eureka stockade in Australia. Yes, you're absolutely right. And the heart, the heart of this is individuality and we've got I've got a couple of points you want to talk about let's talk about individuality you see and what you are displaying is individuality which is the enemy of this global <laughs> management system because as you pointed out Harvey Rubin said that individual rights will have to take a back seat to the collective so this is the this is the very core of the communistic agenda that is being carried out through the UN in Australia through Fabian socialism but without getting into all that the fact is that individuality our autonomy our power of choice is being removed by treaties by laws by bylaws by regulations where our poor farmers now are under so much restriction about being able to farm the land to grow food for us and yet we've got transnational corporations that are coming get, that get environmental waivers tax waivers to rape and pillage the land and our farmers are yeah. forced off well you know, I've been out um, travelling around our farms now for about 12 months talking to farmers. And you know, the sad thing is, Leon, that there aren't very many young people now who want to stay on the land. I know. As a, you know, the family farm thing, the generational farmer is dying. It is. And that's because these young people are seeing exactly what their parents are being put through to, to be able to stay on the land and produce our food. And the, the whole, you know, water shortage thing, the restriction on water, I think South Australia is probably the one that's the most um, further advanced in Agenda 21 in rural communities than anywhere else. Yes. Uh, our dams are being metered, uh, low flow bypasses uh, are being made to be installed, which is what farmers call no flow bypass, all because it's said that these dams are restricting environmental flow. Well, we actually had some calculations done and these, these dams on farms actually collect about 1% to 1.25% of the rainfall that falls on the land. Yet our farmers have already paid for that water and now they've got to pay for it again. Yeah, it's absolutely Same with criminal. the number of head of cattle that, or, or stock that they can run on their lands. They're being restricted with that. Uh, it's, it's just insane. And our law here... Our law here goes against the basic rule of law, remove their right to silence. Uh, 
is allowed to um, demand their, their their personal financial records. Um, that any non-compliance, this government wants to move it into the criminal court. Yep. yep. You know, it's, That's it's it. insanity at its best. And we've got other members of parliament in there sitting and nodding, saying, well, this is a good thing. And, and, and well, also, also, Anne, what, what, if I'm just coming here because this is important, also what's taking place is that the shift is moving from the people that have been elected uh, as representatives to make decisions about these uh, regulations, laws, etc., acts, etc., it's moving to the bureaucratic class and to non-government organisations, which, via the uh, via, via tools like Agenda Twenty One, they yeah. are able to make regulations via the bureaucracy, where the people don't have any choice. That's exactly right. We get uh, our legislation in Parliament, and it's a bare bill, and the guts of it is the regulations that underpin it. We don't see that until about oh, two or three months after the bill's been passed. So we really have no idea what we're voting on in Parliament. And Parliament now, especially in South Australia, is nothing more than an administrative tool, yep. uh, like I said, for UN policy. Yep. And People are happy with that. They're happy with bureaucrats um, running portfolios instead of ministers running portfolios. The ministers are lazy. You know, they don't ask the questions because I think they don't want to hear the answer. And there's always that thing, that plausible deniability. Well, I never knew. Well, you know what? With Agenda 21 now out there being talked about, I'm hoping that these buggers will be held accountable for the decisions that they're making. Yes. Well, as I study this, this system that largely we have inherited, you and I and our generation, going back into the uh, 30s and 40s, people like Bertrand Russell said that every resource will be under control by a central body and it will yep. be administered via the nation states. In other words, exactly what you said, your state parliament is really just a shell. It's just, yes. a, a, just, a, a, just a way of, of saying, yes, yes, administrate, but the bureaucracy behind it, are the ones that control the actual allocation of resources, which which really takes us into private property. And uh, I want to talk about this and the and how our private property rights are being removed. And we can see via uh, things like Kyoto, which where the states took responsibility for the federal uh, offsets, all of this arrangement, this horse trading that took place under Kyoto. And yet, what people don't realise is that all of these UN treaties which uh, were articulated June 11, 1976, which said this, land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset, controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. Now, once again... Um, and I applaud you because you are known as standing for social injustice and this is exactly the wording that is in this UN policy on private property. It goes on to say, if unchecked, in other words, if people are allowed to own their own land and build and farm on it, it will become a major obstacle in the planning and implementation of development schemes. Now, mm. that is code for their global management program administered via the scientific bureaucracy. In other words, private property will mean nothing. You will have to pay for it, but you won't be able to do anything on it because the amount of rules and regis legislation and regulations will be that you will become bankrupt even to put in the application. Yeah, well, we're already seeing that in South Australia, Leon. Um, we're seeing people that own blocks of land that um, have a dirty great tree in the middle of it. They've been sold the land with the expectation that they'll be able to build their home on it. But because we have this significant tree legislation, they can't cut down the tree. So they now have a block of land that they've paid maybe $100,000 for that they can't build on. Yep. And we're seeing, as I said, with farmers, farmers being told that they could be fined $5,000 for moving a rock or 
if you if you need to clear four trees, one lady uh, had to clear four trees off her land um, and was told to plant 850 to replace them. Yep, that's it. We've seen, you know, this sort of thing. And what worries me the most is we have this natural resource management boards that now have more power than the police. They can come onto your property. They can do an audit. They can demand that you take certain actions that could cost you tens of thousands of dollars. If you don't do it, you're in non-compliance. For a family company, the government wants to put those non-compliance fines up to $2.2 million. Yep. This is already in place in South Australia now. And... um, they can come onto your, your place without a warrant, without even reasonable suspicion. And so what happens to the private property owner? He has no recourse except to expend huge amounts of, uh, of money to actually challenge any of these things where he's got the, 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 the massive wealth of the bureaucracy and the power of the bureaucracy he's up against where his private uh, property really means that all he's doing is renting and he must make application to the public control of that land in order for him to use it. I mean, the last statement in that paragraph I read, you said, public control of land use is therefore indispensable. And that's the yes. UN policy. It's public control of private property. Well, we will get into the whole communist Marxist agenda, and that is that private property rights are null and void. You know, and... We are seeing this creeping now uh, at an alarming rate, at an alarming rate. And I'm in the process now. um, We've had a precedent set down here by the High Court, a High Court ruling that if anybody comes onto your your property unannounced, um, that they're in breach. And I'm urging people all around the place, even in the suburbs, to get these signs. There's a sign that's been made up that quotes this. uh, The precedent says three. Uh, to put them on your front fence. And if anybody comes onto your property without your express permission, uh, then they're in breach of this High Court ruling. And that, at the moment, is about the only protection that any of us have got. Yes. Yes, that's it. And And the Magistrates' Court and District Courts, to deal with these issues, like you said, cost you a fortune to go through that process. Um, And it could take months, if not years, for the issue to be resolved. And meantime, you're still in non-compliance and still um, being harassed by natural resource management boards all over the place to um, get you to comply with the legislation. It's a crazy, crazy situation. Look, I talk with, uh, you know, like you do, I talk with our people every week and I've got fishermen ringing me uh, that have been subject to the massive marine parks that have uh, been, you know, legislated in this country. Now, when when you go back and you look at the the history of how this happened, you've got major NGOs like the World Wildlife Fund and others that are behind all of the uh, propaganda and the agitation to make this happen. Now, what that means is, and I haven't got the figures in front of me, but roughly what it means is that Australia now has to import its fish from Asia. So all it means is that the fishing still exists, it still happens, it's still taken out of the ocean, but instead of our own people being able to sustain themselves and our people, instead of there being a sustainable development in the real sense in that we feed our own people with their own fish, it is just transferred to another country that has not agreed to the same legislative tyranny that we have. Well, and not only that, Leon, we had the super trawler incident. You know, marine parks everywhere, uh, our own fishermen can't fish their no-go zones, but this super trawler could come into our waters, strip our waters of of, um, fish, take it on board, process it on board, take it back to South Africa, and we would probably be buying that fish back from South Africa. It's... Like I said, none of this makes any sense. And as for the marine parks, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Kangaroo Island here yes. in South Australia. Um, there was a meeting held down there about uh, these marine parks, and one of my constituents who's lobbying against 
the marine parks, um, was at this meeting and the Minister for Environment was there. And one of the fishermen stood up and said, well, you implement this and that means our fishing industry on Kangaroo Island is done. We, we, we can't make a living. And his response was, well, you'll all have to move to the mainland and get yourself a job. Yep. That's it. And, and look, our fishermen, this is one of the, one of the, the biggest signs that I can see in our rural industry. If the fishing is like, has been the hardest hit at this point, but the others are happening, happening too. But the fishermen, the amount of fishermen that have lost their trades and that have been paid like a million dollar payout to close their business. And yet when you look at the figures, it's actually costing the country many times that more in in actually the transfer the transferring of wealth away from Australia to offshore countries. Well, you know, I I believe that Australia the aim of the game is to reduce Australia to third world status. And I know that's hard for people to to get their head around that a government would intend this for the future of this country. But our marine park areas down here now, we already have um, signs up saying what wonderful um, tourism attractions they are. I have inside information that our marine parks uh, and the beaches that are near those marine parks are going to be exclusive zones yep. for um, tourism sites for the elite. They will be. They'll be wildlands projects. And we won't project. have access to our own beaches. Look, they will be part of the wildlife corridors. And this is... The, yes. The thing is... And what we're talking about is not what we've thought we just think is going to happen. This is what they have said. I mean, listen to this. Uh, Mankind at the turning point. Now is the time to draw up a master plan for organic, sustainable growth and world development based on the global allocation of all finite resources and a new global economic system. 10 or 20 years from today, it will be too late. Now, you said in your speech, here we are. We are now 20 years after that date, right? Yep. And here it is. What we're talking yep. about is the implementation of this global allocation of, and in this point, our fish, our country, Ab- our private land. Absolutely. Well, you know, when I said that here we are now, almost a checkpoint I do believe that a lot of our uh, former leaders, I believe Hawke and Keating knew exactly what they were doing. They did. I believe that Howard probably wasn't uh, as on top of this as he should have been, or either that or we were in so deep by that stage that there was no other option but to sign off on treaties and go along with it because... If Australia pulls out of these treaties, and this is something I can't get an answer to, what sanctions does this country uh, then expose itself to? Do we have uh, export sanctions placed on us or import sanctions when we're relying now heavily on overseas countries like China to prov- and ta- Taiwan to provide us with certain food sources? Do we face... Um, economic sanctions in Australia and if we do that means that we've got to all be prepared all be prepared to go back to square one build up our manufacturing and agricultural base again and become a sovereign nation again and that's the scary part for me what is the way back from this well you're exactly right and and the thing the thing is though it it takes people uh, first there has to be an information program, which is what we're doing now. I mean, that's yep. that's what we're in. We're in the business of trying to help people think about the reality. A lot of people know this thing's wrong. Uh, you know, especially a lot of our aged people, they know that the country is going bad, but they don't always understand why. And when when we can spell out clearly that there is an agenda in place, and behind this agenda, and this is the frightening thing, Anne, Behind this agenda is the very thing that my father went to fight against, which is communism. He went, he went to free people from those systems of thought where they had no choice in the future of their country. 
And and here today we are talking about the exact same thoughts and ideas that we have signed on to which take away our choice. A lot of our fathers would have would roll in the grave if they saw the state that we've come to today. Well, you did right, and that's what I said in my speech. If Hitler was around today, he'd sit back and think, gee, I, I didn't need bullets and tanks and guns uh, for a global takeover because here it is. And it's all been done passively, covertly, incrementally, so that people, it's a bit like the, um, what, what's the experiment, the fly in the jar or the fleas in the jar. You put the lid on and the, the fleas learn that they can jump so high, then you take the lid off and they still only jump that high. They don't get out of the jar. Yep. And we've been exposed to this sort of social engineering, mind programming uh, and conditioning for a very, very long time now that people are looking around at these incremental changes and thinking, oh, well, you know, it's only a small thing. But when you look back and you see all of the small things uh, and the big picture, uh, we're in trouble. We're in real trouble, and I think people need to be um, looking at the big picture stuff. Turn off your television. Don't read the newspapers. I get onto the internet for all of my information, shows like yours as well. Um, I get onto alternative media yes. for where I get my information from. For example, at the beginning of last year, um, you know, the whole financial collapse thing and and all the rest was going on all over the world and there was a a YouTube clip that was put up 500,000 people marching in New York against New World Order yes globalization the signs were very clear Uh, that was never on mainstream media yeah the fact that New World Order had had finally been recognized in America and half a million people came out on one day to protest about it, to let the government know that they knew. But and, where was that on mainstream TV? We heard about Britney Spears going and getting drunk or, exactly. you know, all of that, that gossip new, um, movie star stuff that dulls your mind and, and kills your brain. But the real stuff, you want to find it. I go to YouTube. Like I said, shows like yours I listen to. Brian Wilshire on 2GB. Um, he's been on top of this for years. Uh, that's where people have to switch. Yep. Switch and that's, off that's what from is, the propaganda. That, that's what is taking place. And, and you've got guts. I love, I love what you're saying. Listen to this. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organised habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. And I want to talk about democracy a little bit before we finish. Those sure. who manipulate... This unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are moulded, our tastes formed and our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organised. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner, if they're to live together as a smooth functioning society. And that was from Edward Bernays in his book Propaganda. But what you described at the state of our society, sadly, our children, my children, your children, is this, is that they are manipulated by Hollywood and by television and we need to step outside that matrix in order to find reality. And you mentioned about when when the global financial crisis was happening. Where have we read in the mainstream press about the very people that orchestrated that and the billions of dollars in bonuses they got collectively after all that happened. Absolutely. The the bank bailout. You know, it would have cost the American government far less to actually bail out the people who were losing their houses, pay the debts. It would have cost them far less to do that than it would have to um, bail out the banks. This was all contrived... We all, oh, well, I don't know if we all know, but I know, I certainly know uh, of the part that George Soros plays in most of these financial collapses. He's been doing it for years, um, pulling out um, fluid, fluid um, money out of, out of economies and leaving them bankrupt. George Soros 
is um, a Bilderberg. He is uh, one of the, the the group of elite who believe in depopulation. And if you don't, the global financial crisis, who did it hit the hardest? Working class Absolutely. America. Yep. Working class Australia. Um, self-funded retirees lost their money. Uh, superannuation down the tubes. Um, none of the people at the top actually suffered from the global financial crisis at all. And I still believe, you know, call me a conspiracy theorist, that that whole thing was timed and contrived. Absolutely. I know Abraham, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, there are no accidents in politics. If it happens, you can bet your dollar it was planned. Exactly. Now, I want to talk about another point here and get your your, uh, take on it. Carol Quigley was a historian of the Council of Foreign Relations and other uh, major foundations and think tanks, and he wrote this. The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim. And, and these people we're talking about, Soros and the world bankers, that's, that's what he's talking about, the financial capitalism. Yep. Nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. Now, this is a point specifically I want to refer to something in Australia. This system was to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world, acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. Now, I want to speak about something that's happened in Australia federally, and I know that you're involved in state politics, but we want to have a look at the big picture. The Prime Minister of this country had secret agreements with three major transnational corporations, Rio Tinto, um, BHP and Extrata. In that secret agreement, they come to an agreement about the mining tax, which today we, the people, don't know what happened. Now, all I'm trying to say here is that the science of the way this system was to be developed is happening before our eyes and if we recognise it we will see that it is being implemented right now in our country well I think that's that's pretty obvious to people I'll, I'll, I'll go on a small level you're obviously much more uh, informed on on you know the federal federal stage than I am I'm busy at state level that's enough for me but let me just look at, at or point out what we're doing with our young people. We're encouraging them to take out loans on houses that they can't afford. We're offering them the first home buyer's grant and then everybody else puts their prices up accordingly so there is no gain there. They're being lulled into this um, situation of absolute, um, absolute debt and then they live on credit which only compounds that, that situation. And we will see in this country, I believe, in a few years' time, uh, foreclosures because our banks uh, will claim that they are in trouble, and we will see a run on the banks. And all of those people, same as what happened in America, the bubble's got to burst, and we will see hundreds of thousands of people foreclosed on because they can't pay up their debt within a certain period of time, and. We are lulled into this, uh, you know, get it and get it now. And uh, our young people are being brought up on a system of credit. And, you know, that will be the financial collapse of this country, I do believe. With everything else that the government, the federal government's doing via, you know, big bad taxes and the carbon tax and and all the rest of it, um, we're doing ourselves in by buying, excuse my language, the bullshit that you've got to have everything and you've got to have it straight away. Yeah. And that's right. another mo- n- another form of mind control conditioning programming that, um, you know, y- you don't have to work for a lifetime and end up in your, your latter years comfortable. You've got to be comfortable straight away. Yeah. And it all ties in together. I think there's probably about five or six approaches um, to indebting us and enslaving us to the financial system in play as we speak. You're absolutely right. And the economic uh, debt slavery cycle is, is a very important uh, arm of this octopus. But 
And what I really want to get to uh, is solutions. Um, we uh, we both acknowledge that uh, there is there is an entrenched uh, ideology throughout the bureaucracy and the political class, which uh, really is not in the best interest of Australians and Australian people. We have a situation coming up where a push for local government to be recognised, and you did touch mm-hmm. uh, on this uh, being the dissolution of the states. Uh, yes. I'd like you to just speak a little bit to this and what your thoughts are with this this drive to uh, make local governments uh, recognised in our constitution after two referendums voting it down. Well, first of all, we've got this uh, is it select committee, uh, select committee, federal select committee is taking submissions on this, which in itself is um, going to undermine the whole referendum process. I believe that if they get enough submissions in favour of this, uh, that uh, the whole the whole idea of a referendum will be done away with, because neither of the major parties, and they've said this in the South Australian Parliament, believe that the citizens are well informed enough for us to have referendums. Uh, that this is a way of bypassing that process. Agenda 21, we know, is rolled out at the local government level. We have had a process over probably the last 25 years where our parliaments have been um, uh, ridiculed by the media, where politicians have been fair game, and it's all about that disillusionment of state government, that we're over-governed, that these, these bastards get way too much money for what they do. It's all been part of the process. And if the councils are recognised in our constitution, the next step is to do away with state parliament. That's been told to me by a member of the Labor Party, senior member of the Labor Party. That's their end game. That means that we will be governed at a local level by council who has all the power to implement all of Agenda 21 in its entirety and we will come only under the federal government who we know is absolutely beholden to the UN. Game over. Game over. If this goes through, game over. So what I'm urging people to do, people get a bit um, overwhelmed when they hear the word submission. I've sat on you know, 34 now select committees in Parliament And I know that the big submissions don't get read because you just simply don't get time to read through them all. They are uh, paraphrased for you by a research officer. A one-page letter, it is my will that local government is not recognised in the Constitution and whatever else the terms of reference are, but it is my will that this does not happen. People write a one-page letter and send that in to this select committee in the tens of thousands, then they will not be able to deny that the people have spoken. Absolutely. And as we're talking about solutions, I mean, this is the the most urgent, uh, the, the most urgent thing that we need to address now. Oh, absolutely it is. And, you know, how many months ago, a couple of months ago, it was Bob Hawke, coming out and saying that we should do away with state parliament and just have local council. You know, that was the dip your toe in the water, see if there's a public outrage. There obviously wasn't. So now go ahead with this select committee inquiry into putting local council into the constitution. And they're very sneaky. They they actually tell us what they're going to do. They actually do give us a warning and wait for a response. And what the people of this country, because we are such a trusting way back country they don't understand the people don't understand that silence is consent yes so when they put out these little warning bells in the newspapers and over the media if there isn't a public outrage and a flurry of emails and letters sent to uh, members of parliament and to bob hawk and whoever else makes these statements silence is consent so then they move forward with their plan well that's why this uh, radio media platform was uh, was actually born because yes. we are in resistance to this. We will not be silent. We will speak up, and we will be a voice for the people. And you know, finally, Anne, I'd like to ask. And I don't know what your personal uh, situation is, but would you consider standing as an independent in the federal election? No, I would not. 
and I'll tell you why not. That as as an independent in the in the federal arena, basically uh, you can be less effective there than you can be in your own state parliaments. If we have independence in the state parliaments, you know, state law applies to the states and rarely can the federal government override the states. So it's only in, in matters of national security or uh, those sorts of times that um, the Commonwealth can override. So I believe that independence, true independence, not Labor lackeys, uh, passing themselves off as independents um, or liberal lackeys, that we can make a difference in each state parliament and we can block uh, the legislation, we can um, you know, put it into conference, uh, we can put it into committees to have it reviewed and get uh, opinions on that legislation from uh, organisations outside of the government and we have to do this state by state. At the moment we've got the Greens that are dominating the Senate in the federal federal arena and we have a very powerful lobby group behind the Greens that is making that um, almost an impenetrable barrier and we can't allow that to happen at a state level as well. So I don't have a lot of faith uh, in, in the, the federal system being able to turn, be turned around as quickly yes. as we could turn the states around. Yeah, so you're, you're, you would encourage others who may uh, like to stand as an independent state, you would say that would be a good angle of resistance with the system the way we have it today? And to stand in the upper houses of each state. I know Queensland doesn't have an upper house, which I find quite disturbing, uh, but for every other state that has an upper house... That, that's where the power lies as I said at the beginning of this we have people who are um, trying to run for electorate seats um, you know to, to form part of the lower house or house of assembly whatever it's called in any, every other state whereas in that in that lower house they are obviously deemed quite irrelevant unless you have a hung parliament and yet in the upper house if you had a majority of independents in the upper house, then that is where legislation is blocked. Governments can pass whatever legislation they like in the lower house. You know, they can do their worst. But if it can't get through the upper house, then it doesn't matter what they try and put forward. But it won't get through and it will be stalled. But what we have in South Australia, we have um, seven Labor, seven Liberal, seven independents and crossbenchers. So it's, you know, 21. and But when Labor and Liberal want to push legislation through, which they've done last year, which made me shudder, um, all they do is agree and come together and they've got 14 uh, votes. We only need 11 to get legislation through. So what I'm saying to people in South Australia is we need to take away at least four or five seats from the major parties so that when they come together, they don't have the numbers. Well, Anne, uh, we, we just want to say once again, uh, thank you uh, for your public stand for our people and for our country. Uh, we appreciate your time and I look forward to speaking with you again into the future and maybe we can get into some other issues that we didn't have time to touch on today. Love it. Love to do it, Leon. Love to do it. G'day, folks. It's Fair Income Leon here. I'm the host of Fair Income Radio. We are resistance media of the people, for the people. We document that there is a conspiracy and an agenda to destroy our national identity, our economic independence, the institution of the family, and our independence as a nation. We are at war with forces within government that are intent on destroying our independence and sovereignty as individuals and as a nation. I appeal to you, my fellow Australians, to stand with me as we broadcast in resistance to this agenda. Please support us by sharing this website with family and friends and subscribing to help us continue to be a credible voice of the people for the people.
Thank you, friends. Stay tuned and maintain resistance.